morning, everybody. My name is Duncan Wood. I'm the Vice President for Strategy and New Initiatives here at the Wilson Center, and welcome to the Wilson Center from wherever you're viewing online. Delighted to be able to present this uh, event today on the cobalt supply chain uh, and, uh, and the EV sector. Um, this builds on work that has been taking place here at the Wilson Center over the past uh, two and a half years, looking at the challenge of strengthening the United States supply chains, and in particular, the critical minerals component of that. Uh, back in October of 2021, just over two or almost two, uh, two years ago, we published something called the Mosaic Approach, uh, which was a report that looked at the vulnerabilities in the critical mineral supply chain. We've built on that since. We're currently in the process of analyzing the EV battery supply chain in more detail and expect a report out on that later on this fall. Um, we're delighted that uh, we're able to uh, actually see that work as part of a bigger project now looking at the geopolitics of energy transition, and in particular, the balance between energy security and energy transition. So our work on critical minerals, uh, mobility and energy transition will form part of a larger whole, uh, which is I exactly looking at how does the United States secure its energy supply chains and its energy supplies for the 21st century. I'm delighted also to be able to present our two panelists here today, uh, Mike Blakeney from the Cobalt Institute. We're, lovely, uh, we're so happy that he's able to be here in town uh, with us in person, and uh, we're looking forward to building a uh, productive uh, relationship, collaborative relationship with the Cobalt Institute as we move into 2024. And our dear friend, Jane Nakano, who is the uh, Energy and Climate uh, Senior Fellow at CSIS, um, one of our uh, you know, friends and, uh, uh, and uh, and partners here in town. Uh, Jane has been an integral part of our work on critical minerals and on the EV supply chain over the past couple of years, and we're very grateful for her expertise. Um, this is an event which is uh, you know, largely online, so we'd like to encourage you to send your questions through the website, uh, and I'll be looking at those and, uh, and taking some of those in the time that we have available to us. We're gonna run a tight ship here today. We began on time, we will end on time. So it's a one hour event. So rather than waste any more time with my blurb, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Mike, uh, who will give us his thoughts on where we are currently in the United States and global cobalt supply chain, the challenges that we're, we're seeing there, and uh, ideas that he may have for strengthening that supply chain. Mike, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Duncan. Um, so uh, as you mentioned, my name is Mike Blakeney. I'm from the Cobalt Institute. Just by way of background, we are the Global Trade Association for the Cobalt Industry. Um, we represent the whole value chain from people who are digging the stuff out of the ground to recycling it at the end of its life, trading it, um, building products out of it, refining and processing it, and, and everything in between. Um, so thank you um, to Duncan. Thank you to the Wilson Center for inviting me to speak today. Um, I was talking just before this event, um, and it's, it's, it's interesting because had we done this a few years ago, I think a lot of people would be asking, why is cobalt so important? Why, why do we care about this? Why should we, we be interested in it? And I think we've seen that really change in the last few years. Um, there's a real focus on it now. I think the next step is we go from recognizing um, the need to have a focus, but working out what we actually need to do um, to solve some of the challenges that, that we've identified. Um, just briefly, I want to talk a little about three things today. One, what cobalt is. Uh, second, what it's used for, and three, um, as you mentioned, why it matters for America. Um, I want to explore what it means for foreign and domestic policy, but also whether there are win-wins for the US um, from a policy perspective. Um, but principally, I mean, my call to action today is to say that, um, as we mentioned, we recognize there are challenges in the cobalt sector, but the next step really is identifying what does the US need to do? How do we need to invest both um, you know, financially and from a policy perspective? in it, um, and a key takeaway, um, I hope will come from this, is this is about US engaging with the world and not stepping away from it. So first, why cobalt? Um, cobalt, um, despite what um, you, know, you may have heard, is actually not a particularly rare mineral on Earth. Um, it's actually part of our diet. It's part of vitamin B12. Um, we need it to live. Uh, the challenge, really, is that it's quite hard to find in uh, reserves. Um, we're typically a byproduct of either nickel or copper mining, and so identifying places where you can get cobalt in abundance is um, is, is the challenge. Um, the DRC is a country, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is a country that comes up often in this conversation because they've got, and, and we use typically the US Geological Survey's figures for this, they've got about just shy of 
of global reserves, about 70% of production is from the DRC. Um, other countries that have quite significant reserves include Australia, um, who have about 1.5 million tons versus about 4 million tons in the DRC, so a bit very significant. Um, and then there's a range of other places like Indonesia, the Philippines, Canada, etc., that have uh, reasonably significant um, reserves um, as well. Um, Indonesia actually is the second largest producer of cobalt to date, um, despite having smaller reserves of cobalt. Um, the other thing to mention is that cobalt is highly recyclable. We talk about this a lot. Um, the EU recently passed a piece of legislation that is going to require um, from the early 2030s that 95% of all cobalt in electric vehicle batteries is recycled um, and then re-entering uh, into the, 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 the stream for new, new batteries. That's important because actually it means that by uh, 2050, they reckon that 65% of all cobalt will come from those, um, those end, end of life batteries. Um, which you know is something the US might want to consider thinking about as well. The other thing to talk about is tailings. Um, often, um, I mentioned by, uh, cobalt's a byproduct. Um, cobalt was discarded, nickel was being mined or copper was being mined, the cobalt wasn't deemed to be valuable, it was placed into tailings. Um, by one study from, from one of our members, um, they think there could be, uh, for example, as much as 300,000 tons of cobalt in Queensland in, in Australia, just in tailings alone. Um, very significant numbers, potentially. Uh, more exploration, by the way, needs to be done on that. Um, this is still quite early stage, and, and those are sort of rough figures, but it, it's, it gives you a sense of the scale. Um, and then there are um, other places um, where cobalt may come from um, as well. One thing which is very controversial um, you know, we obviously don't have, have a position as an organization and it, we, we recognize the need to do proper environmental studies, um, but deep sea um, resources potentially as well. Um, between Hawaii and North America, there's potentially about 40 million tons of cobalt res uh, resources, not reserves um, in that region. So lots of different ways that we can get cobalt. But one thing I really wanted to touch on is for me actually getting the raw material, as I've just mentioned, is in some ways, the bit that's easier and easier to diversify. The challenge for me really in the US context is refining because about 70% of all global refining takes place in China. Um, and if the US believes that it, that represents a challenge, um, then obviously it might want to take steps. And, and that really, that, that's the sort of bottleneck because you can get resources from lots of different places. You can have stockpiling. The US obviously has a stockpile of cobalt uh, with the DOD. But if you can't turn that into the forms of cobalt that you need to make, for example, electric vehicle batteries, well, you know, it's not particularly um, useful. So refining and processing is something the US um, might want to explore. And actually, the US has zero um, uh, substantive uh, refining and processing capacity for cobalt today. That is changing. Um, one of our members, for example, Westman Elements, is um, building a... Uh, cobalt refinery in Oklahoma. So that is changing, um, and the Inflation Reduction Act has had an impact there, um, but it is still um, somewhere where the US doesn't have lots. And, and by the way, you can do that profitably in the West. The, the EU, for example, um, has about just shy of 20% of the global cobalt refining market, um, principally in Finland and Belgium. So there's no reason it can't be done in the US. Um, it's just something that hasn't historically taken place here. Um, but that is also important because that is... Uh, relevant to the whole value chain. So if you want a competitive battery manufacturing industry, for example, it helps to have cobalt refining close. And, and you know, just, just an observation is that 80% of all the cobalt that is refined in China is actually used in China as well to make batteries. Um, and so it's, there is a synergy between the refining and processing of these raw materials and the end use. Um, and then finally, um, I just want to talk about, because uh, I, I, I said, so why, why, where is cobalt from? Why does it matter? Um, I think for me, on the sourcing side, um, what I recognize in the US as, as being absent is um, a clear strategy for how, how we do this in the future. Um, uh, our, our recommendation would be having an all of the above sourcing strategy. So there are lots of different ways we can get it. We shouldn't be ruling... Um, anything out necessarily, although recognizing that maybe um, you know we, we need um, more studies in some areas and, and making sure it's done sustainably and responsibly. Um, but you know, being able to do that, 
um, diversifying sourcing, um, engaging geopolitically. Just recently, um, there was a really important announcement that came out of the EU and US jointly around the investment in the Libito corridor in the DRC. That's a really important development, actually, that we can maybe talk about a bit later. Um, but then also, um, and this is an important one, not just what the US can do to source things domestically, but how America can go out into the world to source things. So why is it, for example, that American, com American companies um, aren't mining abroad, and, and, and what, what are the barriers to, to some of the Western companies investing? So I've talked a little bit there about um, the sourcing of it, and I said I'd cover three things. The second thing I wanted to cover was what cobalt is being used for today, which I know will be a, a discussion point. Um, about 70% of all cobalt used today goes into batteries. Um, about 40% of that already is going into electric vehicle batteries, um, and the remainder is going into um, uh, portable electronics, so your phones, your laptops, etc. And then the remaining uses of cobalt is um, in a range of different sectors. Um, the second largest is aerospace. Now, what, what does this mean in practice? I think often we're really focused on the high tonnage um, applications in um, batteries. That's right and proper. Um, it's obviously very important and will continue to be important in the future. But I also just want to draw your attention to that smaller tonnage set of applications um, because many of those are incredibly important. Um, just as an example, defense applications of cobalt. So um, the F-35 fighter jet. Um, you use in that uh, samarium cobalt alloy magnets. You use cobalt in the sensors, in the avionics. Um, you use it as a super alloy in the jet engine turbine. So really, if you want to make some of these high-tech advanced military products, you need cobalt. You can't make it, certainly to the performance that it has today, without. Um, but also in, in other applications like uh, naval assets and, and so on and so forth. Um, in the aerospace sector more generally, so Boeing and others, um, cobalt is something that they will be using to make those products. Um, uh, in agriculture, it's used in animal feed. Um, so that, that's another perhaps unappreciated resource, but, but you know, still important. Um, and in uh, the circuitry of things like electronics and superconductors and other things. So you can see actually encompassed in that smaller range of applications outside the battery space are a whole bunch of things that actually really matter um, in a US context. And, and one thing I forgot to mention as well is uh, in the desulfurization of oil and gas as well. So in, it's used in the oil and gas industry. So there's this whole range of applications that we absolutely need and rely on um, that use cobalt. Um, and batteries, yes, I'm not going to understate how important that is, but I just want to recognize as well it's much broader than that. And then finally, I just wanted to say um, why all of this matters um, if it's not already self-evident. So um, the US has, and I think actually it's a global trend, has really focused in the last couple of years on, on where some of these critical minerals come from and the value chains. Um, cobalt um, is obviously just one of those, but um, an increasingly important one. Just an EU reference here. Um, we were recently designated under one of their pieces of legislation as strategic raw material, and that's all cobalt applications, not just the battery ones, because there's now a recognition in the EU that the whole cobalt value chain is strategically important. Um, I won't go into the detail of that now, but I, th I think it's just relevant in a US context to recognize that this is a conversation that's happening globally. Um, so there needs to be a focus on where we get this stuff from. I've talked a little bit about that already, but really this cuts across US industrial policy, US foreign policy, US domestic policy, geopolitical policy, free and fair trade, um, you know, globalization versus protectionism. All of these things come together in a really cross-cutting way when you look at things like cobalt and critical minerals um, more generally. Um, and in some ways, what we're talking about is these big ticket items, but through the lens of one particular um, substance. And so really, you know, from my perspective, I think this needs to be a horizontal US government approach. There needs to be a geopolitical approach. There needs to be a, an investment approach, both outside the US and inside the US. There needs to be an industrial strategy. And the conversation, you know, we're, we're as you can tell by my accent, I'm not from the US originally. Um, and the reason we're here this week is because we really want to start kickstarting some of these conversations about how do we invest more in cobalt? How does the US, if, if the US's desire is to have um, resilient supply chains for these things, what does that look like in practice? How is that achieved? And how do we make sure that cobalt is something that strengthens America, makes it more prosperous, uh, makes it more secure, 
um, and, and what steps can be taken today to, to make that um, uh, something that um, is, is widely recognised. So with that, I'll just kind of wrap up as an introduction and, and um, look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Mike. You're my favourite uh, panellist so far on this panel because you came in under time, which is always a great thing. <laughs> Jane, now your, uh, your Pressure is on. <laughs> Before we move on to Jane, I just want to um, yeah, just say, uh, make a comment on one thing, which is about this importance, not just of US engagement in the world, which you mentioned, but also the collaborative engagement. You know, working yeah. alongside actors like the European Union, maybe the UK government and others to actually engage in the supply chain because there are things that the United States can do alone, but there are many more things that the United States can do in partnership, and that applies to everyone out there today. So uh, thank you for that, and we'll, we'll revisit that, I think, in the q and I've asked Jane to speak to us a little bit about you know, where we are right now in terms of US government policy towards the cobalt supply chain, and then to give us her thoughts on uh, productive steps forward, what the United States and others can do to actually move our work on the cobalt supply chain into a much more, uh, a much stronger position and to reduce some of those vulnerabilities. So Jane, over to you. Thank you so much, Duncan, for a very uh, generous introduction and always happy to be back at the Walsall Center. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, you know, I fully agree with Mike, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, if we said, well, well, you know, let's get together and talk about cobalt. A lot of, you know, uh, consumers and even some of the, you know, uh, companies might be like, why? Um, I think, you know, in many ways, you know, critical minerals have been, uh, you know, the, let me just rephrase it. The, I guess the U.S. discussion has been at such a high level, I mean, macro level. We've been looking at critical minerals, but there's, you know, so many of them. At least there's 50 of them on the, the um, latest uh, list. And the, the, But the administration has been particularly focused on five or six that are key to the EVs. But, but they each have its own different risk profiles, opportunities, things that they can do to increase the performance of the, the uh, components, et cetera. So it's really, I mean, it's very timely that we're actually getting together and, and you know, focused on uh, specific minerals. Uh, just, you know, quickly on the domestic front, um, it's, you know, the, um, you know, the upstream, uh, the mining uh, progress has been rather limited, even after the, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction uh, Act passage uh, last uh, summer. We have seen very little um, progress uh, in general, uh, and certainly, you know, in the cobalt, it, you know, we have not seen, uh, you know, a lot of uh, sort of the actual program, uh, project-wide uh, level, uh, uh, sort of a, uh, you know, movements uh, forward uh, on the ground. But, uh, in, well, but, and, and uh, when we look at um, information from folks like the S&P Global, uh, you know, because of the IRA, I think the cobalt demand will be higher, about 15%, or maybe it's like 14 or 13, 13% uh, higher in 2035 compared to now, because there'll be greater demand coming from EVs and, and others. So there's, you know, you know, it's you know the uh, the ta the, um, the the priority or the, the need to focus on uh, these minerals are even you know higher now. The um, the so the as far as the the policy development or the evolution the strategy uh, evolution goes, the um, about a year after the administration came in, uh, we saw a couple uh, supply chain reviews, 100 day uh, supply chain reviews. And based on that, uh, the, the, the U.S. Department of the Interior launched the um, working group, uh, interagency working group, and we just saw a final report that's about 200 pages long last week, and that really looks at, um, you know, sort of a complex, uh, that really tried to unpack the complex web of uh, challenges and opportunities that we have for the upstream um, uh, uh, you know, mineral production. And out of that, um, you know, there are a couple, you know, there are, well, 65 recommendations in uh, six different categories. But I think some of these, you know, recommendations will, you know, have to be implemented. I think there are many. I have not fully digested. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge list. But I think it will apply to things like cobalt. Uh, but so at least there are steps that have been taken by the administration. 
also, as far as tools go for the domestic side, uh, the DPA, DPA, the Defense Production Act, has been invoked uh, a few times by this administration and also you know, certainly by the, the uh, previous administration as well. But I think there's much more focused look. Um, the, uh, for example, the uh, gerbil uh, cobalt mining in Idaho, uh, even though uh, back in May, uh, the, the project was sort of paused given uh, the global market that, or the, the cobalt pricing environment not quite favoring uh, the company to keep, you know, sort of working at this time. But the DPA funding uh, has been made available, uh, about $15 million of it. And there are a couple others, non-cobalt related, but the DPA funding has been made available. And, but just to note, you know, the DPA, invoking DPA authority, Title III authority, doesn't mean that you actually have funding. But you know, thanks to IRA, and also there's the additional uh, Ukraine um, supplemental uh, authorization, uh, I'm sorry, Appropriations Act, uh, that have made funding available for upstream uh, um, progress. So I think we're still, you know, um, for better or worse, at that stage, early stage, but there's definitely, uh, you know, government investment that's, you know, being made very actively. On the international side, just quickly, um, so when we look at a list of uh, top five countries that do have uh, cobalt resources, DRC is so dominant, like, you know, about 80%. And, but then there, there are Indonesia, Russia, uh, Australia, and Canada. I think they're all sort of the share, uh, the, the figures are in the single digits. But there are also you know, other countries that we probably have a little longer um, uh, working relationships with. Then, uh, but I think you're right. I mean, the, but the DRC is a country that you know, the US government is starting to be uh, much more proactive in trying to engage. Um, December of 2022, uh, the Biden administration uh, uh, signed a, a memorandum of understanding to work with both DRC and Zambia. Uh, both are very rich in uh, cobalt and, and you know, copper and those resources. And uh, obviously, signing a document doesn't really, you know, mean that I, you know, the companies can really go in and, and make commercial you know, case out of it. But I think that's a very important step towards US government recognizing that the, the type of partnership that the resource-rich developing countries are asking for is not just sort of you know, simply you know, try to secure supply, but be a little more of a partner uh, in their effort to develop supply chains get more of a value add from these minerals and, and metals that these countries uh, have, you know, uh, the wealth of uh, endowment. And that's something, you know, that I think, um, uh, you know, the administration is quite focused on, um, you know, hoping to have, uh, you know, more, um, you know, further steps, something um, to really show for. Uh, but also, it's not just the mining, uh, it's, it's also the processing capacity. You know, so much of the, the cobalt out of DRC goes to China because China, um, if, unless I'm a little out of date, but um, if I'm not mistaken, roughly 15 out of 17 uh, cobalt operations in DRC are owned uh, entirely or partly uh, by the Chinese. And you know, a lot of supply goes back to China, and then China processes uh, these minerals, and I mean, certainly cobalt. So it's not just the who has these resources, and then also you know, technical reserves, but who has the capacity uh, to process them. And there, I do think you know, it's not just you know, the US government trying to engage these resource-rich country, resource -rich developing countries, perhaps through things like the Mineral um, Security Partnership, but the, some of the bilateral engagements with others like Canada um, and also Australia could be extremely interesting approach. Um, the, but I'm sorry, let me just, you know, I think I sort of uh, went a little too ahead of the, my, um, another thing that I want to definitely talk about, the, um, under the, the Mineral Security Partnership, you know, now it's, you know, uh, it has 14 member or, or partner countries, and the last one was India joining in June. But, you know, there are so many, um, uh, there's so much excitement. I, I think we haven't seen a lot come out of it, but it's only the second year uh, since the, you know, the MSP was launched. I think that the uh, Development Finance Corporation uh, now has, um, you know, uh, you know, more, um, 
sort of, I think, latitude, getting into not just the low and um, you know, middle to low income countries, but some of the countries that, that are slightly wealthier, but have very strategic importance to the US government. And you know, they have so many tools, like loans, loan guarantees, political risk, money. Um, so I, I very much look forward to having some you know, success cases, successful cases out of the DFC going forward. And so far, I mean, they have, um, uh, you know, uh, they have given money to the TechMet uh, project in Brazil that looks at the nickel and cobalt. But I think you know more uh, is to come, from what I understand. And and then sort of then going back to the, the refining thing, there was uh, just quickly. I think my understanding. I mean, looking at all the trade data and stuff, the U.S. Uh, supply cobalt supply goes to the very little that we produce goes to uh, Canada for refining. Um, and I think Mike also uh, has noted that. I think it's nice to have um, some, you know, long-standing partner countries such as Canada uh, that do have refining capacity uh, that could help U.S. upstream uh, ha make uh, be able to make stronger case. But but that alone wouldn't be a solution. I think you know we will still need work, you know um, stronger partnership with other countries like DRC, but then also Australia is another one. It's the fourth largest global supply of cobalt. I think um, the current administration request for Australia to be considered to be domestic source um, under the DPA title uh, three, um, you know, is, is a, I think it's a very welcome step um, that would allow the US um, um, uh, companies and uh, many programs to be able to um, have the synergy that could come from countries such as Australia as well as Canada that we have shared political norms and, and also market-based uh, systems. Um, I guess I kind of spoke, but, but I guess quickly though, um, what, should, what could be done more? So, um, you know, again, uh, I do, I love to see more um, sort of successful cases out of the, these initiatives, um, but then also, um, when it comes to recycle, I'm glad that Mike also mentioned that. Um, I think the U.S. compared to the EU or Washington compared to Brussels has been a lot quieter about the recycling rules and such. I think we need to be there to be able to uh, shape the discussion, shape the 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 um, uh, the whole you know the, um, you know the the tone and the scope of regulations going forward for these battery uh, minerals, including cobalt. And also the, uh, the market reform or modernization. One of my colleagues at CSIS, uh, Maria uh, Kroll uh, Sinclair, has recently written a really good piece looking at how the market, the minerals market, um, markets have lacked transparency and liquidity uh, to be able to get more private capital coming in. And I think it might be particularly pertinent to cobalt because as Mike said, cobalt is a byproduct of nickel and copper. So there's no buffer. Um, I mean, so when the, those, so it, you know, often the cobalt uh, projects, you know, rely on these others to be able to make commercial case. So it's not just the you know, cobalt market prices, but then very much affected by others as well. So I think that uh, perhaps you know, not, you know, the US, uh, EU, UK, uh, these regulators can really get you know, together and really look at the sources of the recent uh, market failures in these mineral commodities, uh, com commodity markets, and try to figure out uh, you know, what needs to be done to make, uh, to increase the liquidity and transparency in these markets. So let me just uh, end there, thanks. Thank you, Jane. Um, listen, what the, the common theme from both of you, I think, is about US engagement in the world, US collaboration with partners and allies. Um, and so we've got a number of questions that are coming in through the website, and I encourage other people to please to submit your questions through the webpage. Um, but the first question that I have for both of you, and beginning with Mike, um, is you know, the potential uh, for US-EU collaboration. Globally, um, you, made, you gave a specific example of collaboration in investment in the Libido Corridor, corridor in, the, in the DRC. Um, would love to hear more about that. Um, Jane, you talked about um, development financing. And I think that you know, the DFC is an issue that we are struggling with here at the, uh, the Wilson Center right now about how the United States strengthens its tools that it has, it has for partnership with developing countries 
um, in particular as they pertain to the supply chain. Um, and so, you know, any ideas that you might have on, on, on that question, and in particular, you know, how does the DFC partner with development finance corporations or organizations from other parts of the world? One of the points that we, we commonly raise is that the Chinese have this enormous um, you know, uh, sort of fund available to them for development finance. The United States, the Europeans, the Brits, et cetera, have a lot less. But if you put it all together, it actually becomes much more competitive. So if you can use something like the Mineral Security Partnership, not just as a way of looking at the supply chain, you know, writ large, but specifically about how do we partner in uh, resource-rich countries to make our proposition mu of much more value to them. And I think that's, be, you know, back to the question that you raised, Jane, which is that we need to have real partnership, not just an extractive relationship there. And that comes up very, very often in our conversations. So let's begin with that. I'll turn it over to you, Mike, first of all, and then over to you, Jane. Thanks, Duncan. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I guess I'd start off with a first observation, which is the Inflation Reduction Act has been hugely successful um, at attracting investment. I guess the challenge for me is that if what the Inflation Reduction Act does in practice is move investments from the EU to the US, mm -hmm. well, that's helped neither um, to diversify its relationship with the world. Um, now, as I say, you know, we're a global free trade organization. I don't want to get drawn into... Um, you know, too much detail on those things, but but you know, clearly, if that's the aim of the U.S., then then that's not achieving its aim. So, I think there does need to be collaboration between the U.S., the EU, U.K., and others. I also think, and this goes back to the point about the U.S.'s place in the world, is this isn't just about um, what the U.S. can do for itself, but also how can it step out into the world with countries like the DRC and say, let's let's work with you guys to help develop a relationship that um, leads to mutual prosperity. And you make a really important point. We do lots of work in the DRC, and one thing we always hear from them and from others is, you know, when companies come in and mine, um, it adds a lot of value um, to the local areas, but that's temporary, that only exists for as long as the resources exist. It's a very finite scope. And um, what they want is they want more of the value addition. They want more of the refining and processing. They want to do it, which, by the way, is the same thing the U.S. wants. Um, and it makes sense for refining to be in one of two places, next to the end user or next to the mine. So, so that makes sense. Um, and really, I think what this comes down to is this whole thing, um, critical minerals, the energy transition, is it's a global race um, where people are investing... Um, companies are growing, um, and the question for me comes down to how does, um, how, how do you attract that investment? How do you make it profitable to do it in places like the US or wherever um, in that global environment? And, and one thing that we just, we are seeing more and more is um, incentives, because more and more places are offering incentives, they're trying to attract those indices, and so, you know, you need to be globally competitive on that, but also making sure that um, we allow companies, companies to operate and we don't introduce um, unnecessary um, barriers. So, yeah, it's all those things. And, and you mentioned the Libito Corridor and, and talking a bit more about that, and, and I'm happy to. I think this was a really interesting project because, and it's something we've been talking about for a while because it's, it's a great example. So this is a railway link, some of it already existing, some of it will be new, going from the north of Zambia through the DRC out towards the Angolan port of Lubito, and this is important for two reasons. One, it connects this whole mining region together. Yeah. It creates value addition. It creates economic multipliers. It makes it more attractive to do things like refining and processing and other industries, which, you know, it's great for the DRC because that's what they want. They, they want that investment. They, they want to grow their economy. They want to diversify from just doing the mining. So they, they, they love it. It's great from the US's perspective because now you've got a port coming out um, the, the west of the country, which makes it easier for US producers to get access to this stuff, be more competitive. So it's a win-win for everyone. And I think that's why it's a really good example of what can be done to both boost the supplier side, uh, the producer side, uh, sorry, the, the consumer side, um, and grow industries. Um, and we should be looking for more projects like that. Thank you, Mike. Before I turn the microphone over to, to Jane, I do I want to make a couple of comments. Number one, I think we're going to hire you to be a spokesperson <laughs> for the Wilson Center because you actually talk about this question of U.S. engagement in a way that, you know, that is part of our mission, is that we believe that the United States can and should play a positive role in the world. 
And so, you know, and it's obviously the, you know, part of the legacy of President Woodrow Wilson was that the United States should be engaged in the world. So thank you for that. Number two, you know, people, I think, often think about refining and processing as being, well, you're going to have, you know, one place where you refine and process. In fact, processing can be multi-stage. And there's processing that can take place on the mine site, for example, mm. that reduces the weight of the ore that you're going to take out of the country and move around the world, thereby reducing your transportation costs, adding some local value, and reducing the climate impact because you don't have to shift all that you know, unnecessary bulk around the world as well, which I think is a very, very important point there. Um, and you know, I think we, just, we need to take a more you know, sophisticated, nuanced approach to this. I think we've, we've come a long way in the past two years in understanding the, uh, the supply chain, but we still have a long way to go in understanding that there are things that we can and should do here in the United States. There are things that we can and should do in other countries. And you know, lastly, I would say, you, know, you talk about a rail link. How often has it come up in the past 10 years that in fact rail is not the, the past, it is the future? That rail is actually how you can actually move things around. And it's not just about moving the thing that you build it for, it's about actually adding value to the community, the local economy, to the national economy. You're connecting places. I have a colleague in South Africa who does work on how long it takes to get goods from a producing community to the nearest port mm. and does video blogs on this. Um, and it's extraordinary. I mean, the roads are in a terrible state. The bridges are weak, so you can't actually take a fully laden truck with ore across that bridge because it'll collapse. We build rail links and we build proper bridges and highways it adds something to everybody in the local community. Enough from me, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Um, so, um, I mean, I think Mike did a great job um, outlining, but if I may, uh, just a uh, couple of points to add. So as, uh, I failed to mention that, you know, DFC can also finance um, not just, you know, the m upstream, but then related infrastructure projects. So that's obviously not makes DFC to be an extremely valuable tool. Um, but when it comes to sort of a competition with China, uh, you did mention Built and Road Initiative, Duncan. I think there are two questions that I have. I don't have answers yet. I think BRI has been, you know, for China, a way to access some of the resources abroad, but then also um, at the same time, way to um, relocate its excess capacity, including manufacturing. So it'd be really interesting to see how the, the current economic slowdown, it's not declining, it's just it's not growing as quickly um, as before, how that may change how they try to engage with countries around the world that used to, uh, you know, maybe there'll be added push uh, to uh, get more, you know, uh, construction work, more, you know, infrastructure, that would obviously make make it harder for Washington and or, you know, Brussels to uh, compete. But for that reason, I think we really have to be, you know, Washington needs to be working much closely with uh, our partner governments. But, the, but also there has been all these local pushbacks that we keep hearing uh, about, you know, pipeline infrastructures or coal-fired power plants in Belt and Road Initiative countries. And I think the, the sense of equity from these, you know, resource-rich countries uh, is real. And um, you know, I think you know, um, now, you know, if it's not now, um, you know, I mean, I think the window will not stay open forever. So I think you know, Washington, Brussels, and other like-minded governments really need to uh, be able to make very strong, concrete case uh, to these resource-rich developing countries and be partners, you know, earn the, the confidence from these countries uh, by, you know, uh, you know, uh, having more probably streamlined uh, way of evaluating uh, what projects uh, we want to be supporting. But that takes me to the second set of questions, which is, um, I think it's great, uh, I'm actually really excited about this, you know, US um, DR DRC, uh, Zambia, you know, um, uh, EV value chain development type of cooperation. But EV battery supply chain is not exactly, um, you know, where U.S. is dominating at the moment. Again, there's this element of geoeconomic competition with the Chinese. So in order for us to be able to be that, you know, competitive partner to these countries, we certainly have some 
more work to do at home so that we can actually go in with expertise um, and you know, cost competitive operational track record and, and so forth. So um, you know, again, these are not really answers. I think these are things that are, you know, I think need uh, even closer attention um, and more, yeah, let me just stop there. Great, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I wanna take the first of our questions online and then I'll come to you, Eric, okay? Um, and this one, I think it should have a, um, a pretty concise answer. Um, in fact, Jane, you talked earlier on about the Javois case and the fact that you know, they weren't able to move ahead in the way they wanted to because of the price. This one is about uh, the price itself. The cobalt price has been very volatile. In 2017 and 2020, the price suddenly tripled. Who is controlling the cobalt price or what is the most influential affair to push, cobalt price, to push the cobalt price very high? Mike. Um, we have to be a bit careful talking about pricing because um, we, we obviously don't want to stray into anti-competition territory as an yeah. organization. But what, what I will say is this, is um, the cobalt price was obviously very high um, a year and a half ago. It's very low today. And the two main drivers that we see for that are, number one, the slowdown in China, which has depressed, um, uh, and globally, which has depressed um, uh, demand uh, for cobalt. Um, but also, secondly, we've also seen a lot more supply coming on stream. So it's a combination of those two things. I would just add another thing, which is one of the um, specificities around cobalt is that because we are, in most places, a byproduct of nickel and copper, the normal rules about supply and demand are not as clear cut. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, if someone wants to have more cobalt capacity, we are talking about in the DRC, for example, building a copper mine, um, and so the two are linked. So it, it's a complex market, and it's not as simple as maybe some of the others. And so as we, uh, as electrification advances throughout the world, and we're building out grids, we're building out electrical circuits in homes, et cetera, et cetera, demand for copper is going up, which means that we should see an increase in the supply of cobalt as well as a byproduct of that. Is that yeah, and it, it's this whole complicated story as well, because um, because so much of our use is in batteries, then you get into conversations about, well, okay, um, you have, we most commonly um, in electric vehicles use either a, an NCA-type battery or an NMC-type battery. Um, and with the NMC batteries, for example, you get different chemistry. Mm -hmm. So there's a 622 chemistry is the most commonly used today, and that's just the ratio of 60% nickel, 20% manganese, 20% cobalt, and people are trying to move towards an 811 chemistry um, because it's, it's um, you know, judged to be more performant and lower cost. Um, you'd still see a massive increase, by the way, of cobalt consumption even yes. in, in, into that um, scenario, but, but that then has questions about the supply of uh, the raw materials because obviously these ratios, and how does that ratio then compare to what you're getting out the ground in these yeah. different places, and it does vary. Um, but then also, what are the other uses of things like nickel, and how does that, because that's a lot of nickel is used, for example, in stainless steel or right. steel production. And then if you know, there's a sudden increase in demand for steel or a decrease, that affects the production of nickel and then affects the production of cobalt. So you get, I, I, I'm probably confusing everyone, which is to say that's kind of part of the reason for the confusingness of the price is that, um, all of these things are interrelated, but I would just bring it back to a broader point, which is I think this is also part of the reason why, um, you know, as, as you said, Jane, you know, I, I think part of this conversation today is, and generally is, I think we've all started to wake up to some of the challenges that exist. Um, and I think the next step is really working out what we do about that and how we manage that and volatility of prices. There's probably some mechanisms you can put in place. There's probably some things you can't change. Um, but then, you know, what does that look like and, and, and how, does, uh, how does policy respond to that? Anything you want to add, Jane? Not much, I mean, except to say that I think high prices uh, does, is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, that's when, you know, companies can see value. But volatility, of course, makes it a lot more challenging and that could really favor uh, non, you know, uh, private, some of the state, you know, driven, um, you know, programs or projects to be, you know, much more, um, you know, viable versus, you know, private capital, so. <laughs> I mean, in some ways, this is a classic commodities issue, isn't it? Which is that high prices bring investment, investment increases supply, the supply then depresses prices, people don't invest. I mean, it's, we, we, how many times have we seen that in the oil and gas industry, for example? Eric. Thank you, Duncan. Um, Eric Miller, I'm Senior Advisor to Jervois Global here in Washington. So I wanted to pick up a little bit on the 
what do we do about the price issue. I think in many respects, the challenge that you've seen is as you've had massive Chinese destocking coming out of zero COVID, that depressed prices. Mm -hmm. You also have the role of the SRB, which is the buyer seller entity within China. And so given China's level of refining, it has the capacity to dominate the market. Mm -hmm. And it has the ability to move prices unquestionably. We've seen what happens when uh, there's an announcement of either growing the, the stockpile or lowering the stockpile prices respond accordingly. And so you're also dealing with a commodity that has a relatively shallow market. So this is not like gold where there's bucket loads of projects and a deeply established market that is not really influenced to, to the extent by one country or one producer. And so part of the thinking has been you know, how do you get a price support mechanism in place that allows you to sustain investment through the cycle? And so uh, in the case of Gervois, what you saw was as prices went down, uh, in our view, much due to China, you had an ability to not have a mine in Idaho be sustainable. And so if this is the strategic metal, which I think it, we all need to, need to feel it is, then we need some mechanism that you can have where uh, potentially companies can draw from a particular pool of capital when prices are low and pay into it when, when prices are high as a way of stabilizing. Maybe you don't make as much money on the top end because you're paying into it. But what that means is that in, in this market susceptible to Chinese domination, you have a way of neutralizing their power. And so... You know, that's certainly something that, that we're seeing, and I wanted to get a sense from you, I guess, Mike, about what, what you're seeing in other parts of the world as people try to develop cobalt projects in environments of extreme volatility. Yeah, I mean, so some, something we've talked about um, in the past is, is also access to finance for some of these things. Um, and, and, you know, one of the challenges I hear a lot, um, and I'd be interested to know how, you, how you've experienced this, is... Um, when you've got volatile prices, um, when you're investing in um, you know, countries where there's well-known ESG issues, for example, all those things make it harder to get access to private finance. And um, what you know, if we recognize that it's important that country companies like Javois are investing um, you know, in the US, wherever, um, but they can't get access to finance, is there then a role for Congress or for the White House to step in and, and support that. And that doesn't mean subsidies necessarily. It could mean, as you mentioned before, loan guarantees. It could mean uh, insurance. It could mean all sorts of different things um, that might not actually cost a penny if everything goes fine. But then if, if, if things become challenging, that kicks in just to help companies to invest. But then also domestically as well, because, you know, you know even you know, with the Inflation Reduction Act, even with, um, you know, uh, everything else, you know, it's it's obviously been a challenge in the U.S. to set up that mine. And if, you know, Congress is saying, well, actually, we want to do more of this stuff in the U.S., great, but how and what does it look like in practice and how do you help companies like Chevrolet to do that? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's. Um, I think this this kind of strikes the very heart of, of what we're talking about today. Um, and, yeah, I think, I think there's a number of different ways you can answer that, but I, I think this is the next step, really, in this conversation is what do we actually do practically? So you just mentioned ESG concerns. Yeah. Um, our environmental change security program here at the Wilson Center is doing some very interesting work right now, bringing together different stakeholders, you know, private sector, policymakers, but most importantly here, bringing some of the NGOs, civil society representatives into the room so they can talk to each other in a safe space, off the record, just to try to build understanding between the two sides. And one of the issues that comes up repeatedly in that is the question of um, traceability. Uh, due diligence in the supply chain, and of course, you know, the ESG component yeah. writ large. Uh, building on the work of our environmental change security program, we'll be looking later on this fall at the technologies that can be applied to improve traceability within the supply chain. Um, and of course, there are various organizations around the world that focus on this. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts, uh, Jane, and, and then Mike, on the question of traceability. You know, what you see as being sort of a productive way forward on that on that front. 
because it is something that's going to become very, very important, not just for ESG, but also for global competition against China. Um, and, you know, more generally, this is something that battery manufacturers and automobile manufacturers have to care about, not just because of regulations, but because of shareholders mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and in institutional investors. So Jane, I wonder if you give us your take on that. Yeah, uh, um, no, thank you for mentioning tra traceability um, and ESG. I mean, it's in many ways, um, you know, it's not, it's also the what the consumers want, what the consumers expect um, manufacturers along the, the value chains, uh, you know, how they are behaving, uh, et cetera. And, and without, and I, I really haven't looked closely into more about, you know, techno like what you know, exactly, you know, the, the, on the technology front, you know, um, you know, things are being developed uh, yet. But I think that without that, we wouldn't be able to make a really uh, concrete case to uh, consumers but that, uh, about, you know, how, you know, what they are buying from, mobile, you know, um, certain producers uh, that, get minerals from, uh, you know, uh, ESG compliant environments, um, you know, I mean, it just, we wouldn't be able to make that argument, like how it's not, you know, uh, you know, in the force, you know, uh, using forced labor or child labor. Um, so it's, I think it's really fundamental. Um, and I think it's just, maybe it's something that, uh, um, I think there is growing interest, but I think it's in general, uh, there's a lot, lot more, um, not just a policy discussion, but precisely I think the technology, but then certain rules uh, that need to be better appreciated. Um, and there too, I think, you know, it certainly needs to be global. Um, you know, having individual countries come out with its own set wouldn't really uh, make, you know, wouldn't, well, because the, the companies in especially, uh, you know, mining majors are truly international. So I, I, I'm, you know, hoping to see much sort of a, um, um, coordination and conversation consultations among uh, major capitals be uh, facilitated. Um, but it's, um, you know, I think it, it's, you know, um, I'm really glad to hear that uh, you know your colleagues are doing <laughs> it. But again, I, I really haven't really looked into the uh, much more technical aspects of that, though, unfortunately. Mike, yeah, I'll, I'll answer it in two steps. So number one, um, and, and Jane, you made the point about global cooperation. I think that's a really important point. Um, sorry to keep referring to the EU, but I, I think it's just interesting to get the synergies across. Um, just literally within the last few months, the EU's finalized um, its new battery regulation. And a part of that is the creation of an EU battery passport, which is a traceability scheme right. um, that will start with a labeling requirement and then move to, to more detailed requirements. So um, we're a member of the Global Battery Alliance and a bunch of other initiatives, multi-stakeholder initiatives um, globally. Um, and there's so many things happening on the traceability front, um, both legislatively um, and uh, informally through, um, or, you know, formally, but through um, uh, you know, non-governmental organizations and others. Um, and really, I think th there's, there's, there's a need to pull some of these things together and make sure it's coordinated, it's integrated. I mean, to your point, Jane, we don't want to end up with a system where there's a traceability scheme in the US and a traceability scheme in the EU, and the requirements are very different, their effectiveness is very different, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I, I think bringing that together is really helpful. And I, I just want to touch briefly on, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the US role in the world today in engagement, and I think this is a really important point. Um, with the DRC, there's well-documented um, ESG issues in the supply chain. I think everyone knows about it. Um, the challenge really exists because um, it's not a wealthy place, um, but it has lots of wealthy minerals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you put together lots of valuable metals with people who don't have a lot of money and, and you know, people are going to try and extract it informally. Um, and that's what you see. And even if uh, much of that is illegal, it, it still happens. Um, but it also doesn't diminish the need for these people to have a livelihood and to continue to earn a living. And really, my, my one point on this uh, in the DRC specifically would be that this is about US engagement, not mm -hmm. disengagement. Mm -hmm. If the US disengages because it's hard, or if companies disengage because it's hard, that potentially makes the issues worse. And then, uh, you know, we talked about how much of the DRC, um, of the cobalt supply chain the DRC is, that has impacts all over. So really, I think, Again, this is about strategy, and this is saying, 
the solution actually to those issues is more engagement, more formalization, more strategic um, you know, cooperation with the DRC government and with others to give people economic alternatives, to give people access to a living that can be done uh, formally uh, with proper protections in place, with proper salaries, not exploitative. Um, and then from there, go towards having traceability schemes that you're absolutely right. You know, consumers want and expect. They're saying, well, I want to know um, that everything that is, is in my um, product has, has come from a sustainable source. So, um, so this, again, you know, I think you know, to reiterate the point, everything we've talked about today is about engagement, U.S. engagement with the world, you know, having a strategy, having a plan, not, not shrinking away from the challenges, but really saying how do we address them. Um, this is exactly one of those, and international cooperation as well. So you know, I think this kind of cuts to the heart of everything that, that we've been covering. Absolutely. And just one thing I'll add there is um, you know, we, we're focused here on the critical mineral supply chain, on cobalt specifically. But this applies, the question of traceability applies across the economy now. Yeah. And because of things like the Uyghur Forced Labor Act, you know, companies don't only have sort of a, you know, regulations they have to comply with. They face significant fines if unwittingly they violate the regulations. And, you know, Customs and Border Protection has, doesn't just have an obligation to uh, investigate. They now have dedicated resources to do investigations into this. So I think that not only do we need to think about this across countries and we have a global approach to it, we also need to think about how this applies across different economic sectors because that same technology that you're going to apply to you know, cobalt should be applied to aluminum, should be applied to steel, should be applied to clothing, should be applied to, you know, this is the way that I think we're going to move forward because there you begin to see the economies of scale and the building out of a technology that can really help us <coughs> move this forward. We've come to the end of our session here today. I want to thank our, our panelists, Mike and, uh, and Jane, very much for their expertise and their participation here today. Thank you to all of you who watched online. Please look out for uh, more programming on critical minerals here at the Wilson Center. We're very, very fortunate here that we have you know, not only my Office of Strategy and New Initiatives, but we have our Environmental Change Security Program, our Canada Institute, Mexico Institute, Latin American Program, Africa Program, Asia Program, our Polar Institute, all doing work on critical minerals, which gives us this cross-regional approach, which is so very vulnerable, vulnerable valuable, sorry, <laughs> and, uh, and also a really a hallmark of the, of the Wilson Center's work. So please stay tuned to this, uh, this space, and we'll see you again very soon. Have a great day.